I'm going to pass straight over to Adam. Take it away. Hey, well, um, thanks everyone for having me. And uh, Matthew, um, I think, missed perhaps the most important and relevant part of my CV from his um, very generous introduction, which is that I spent most of my life as a young green. Um, unfortunately, I'm now too old, but uh, I kind of pretend otherwise occasionally. Um, so it's really nice to be here and, um, and just sad not to be there with you all in person or not to be in any one place with all you in person. Um, although happy because I'd rather not die, you know. Um, I am going to chat today, as it says, about democracy and radical democracy politics and the failure of politics in the context of crisis and, and the current crisis. And I'm really going to do that um, through kind of two different frames, um, the nation and the state. And I think that we need to try and separate these two kind of basic ideas of how our politics are mediated in our minds before we start. I think that's a very important way to understand a lot of what's going on at the moment. And I'm going to try and do this in a slightly more interactive way than I normally would do a Zoom talk, partly because um, I spent a lot of time over the last few weeks kind of shouting into my laptop and uh, getting bored of my own voice. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, if you imagine we're kind of sat in a lecture theatre, and when I ask a question, if you could just like furiously type into the chat box, I can see your answers, and then we can have some kind of semblance of interaction as though you were there in real life because I get very bored just talking at you. So the first question I want to ask you all um, is can you think of examples of things that you've been told recently shouldn't be politicized or you know you're making it political or are, are, are too political? Um, can you write in the so, so Steve says the crisis, the NHS, Extinction Rebellion, the NHS, climate emergency, frontline workers. Um, someone thinks, sorry, can you repeat? So the question is, um, can you think of examples of things which you've been told you shouldn't politicize or you're making too political? Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so we're listing lots and lots of things. So everyone's giving great examples, um, biodiversity loss, education, climate change, pretty much everything, religion, and I find this phenomenon fascinating. People say, you know, don't, don't politicize that, don't politicize this. And, and I, so I, I spend a lot of my life going around talking to people in various countries in the world and in various places in this country what, about what they think politics is and, and what they think it isn't and how much they think the thing that they think politics is does or doesn't serve their interests and so on. Because of course, in reality, politics should be how we negotiate, how we live together, it's kind of a synonym for democracy. And it's absolutely vital that all the important decisions in society are made through politics, through democracy, rather than through the alternatives, which are either the market or some kind of authoritarianism, probably built on the kind of structures of racism and sexism that we've inherited in the world that we live in. And so, you know, it's absolutely vital that all these things are politicized. But I think that often the most effective strategy there is in shutting down democracy and shutting out progressive ideas that challenge power through a crisis is by saying you shouldn't politicize it. Don't politicize this thing. And so um, you've all given very good examples. Um, so my second question is this. Um, are people familiar with the word reification? So, so what do I mean when I say reification? If you could, again, just type in the chat box. No idea. Naturalization, question mark, question mark. Making something a thing. Jamie knows what reification is. Yeah, and Matthew. Very good. So yeah, so reification is the process of, well, it's, it's taking a social process, so something that we just kind of do as society, and drawing a line around it and saying that it's, that is a thing. And of course, we can all do that all the time. I've just reified the idea of reification. I'm just, you know, people, people are always in conversation. And in order to understand things, we need to reify them and look at them. But what I think is very interesting is the way that over the last 40 years, uh, the period of neoliberalism in particular, the idea of politics has shifted from kind of how we live together as a society and something that we all might participate in and we're all involved in, to a thing over there that we watch and that's sold back to us. 
And so that's a kind of example of how a lot of people, a lot of theorists have thought about the relationship between reification and capitalism in the past, because a lot of what capitalism does is draw a ring around a social process, something we just do with each other as humans all the time as a society, and then sell it back to us. And I think that one of the things that neoliberalism has done is it's reified the idea of politics, it's turned politics into a thing external from us as people, and then sold it back to us through the kind of reality TV and uh, broadcast industry that's grown up in recent years. I think it's very telling that I think yesterday um, Netflix overtook ExxonMobil as um, in, in terms of size of company. And, you know, if we think about the kind of nature of the political economy now, the fact that the sort of broadcast data industrial complex is the biggest industry in the world, and that sells politics to us as a product that we buy or don't, then someone was talking about the attention economy, we could talk about that, we could talk about surveillance capitalism. But what I'm interested in thinking about now is not the economic impact of this, but the political impact of this. How, you know, if you talk to people about politics, then what I find fascinating is in most of Europe, so I spent February in Central Europe, interviewing people in Ukraine and Hungary and Slovakia and Czechia, right across those countries, asking the questions like, you know, what do you think of the politics in your country? What do you think of the most common answers that I get is, like, so I was in Nearing Haza in Eastern Hungary, people were like, why are you here? Politics happens in Budapest. So politics was something away from them that they watched on their television. They didn't make part. So what do people mean when they say, don't politicize the crisis? What they mean is, well, politics is this totally awful game show that happens over there. I want nothing to do with. And so I'm going to reject that, refuse to take part in it. And I think decisions in the world should be made in a different kind of way. Now, here's my third question. Why is it that, on the whole, the right benefits from that process rather than the left? I, I can think of three reasons, but you might think of other ones as well. So again, if you write in the chat box, why do you think it is that the right, and as we see in the world right now, you know, that this process of the reification of politics has led not to the rise of the left and anger, but the rise of the right. The centralization of power, yeah. So, so Jamie says centralization of power, and I think that's one thing that's definitely gone on. And we see this particularly in the UK where um, since the 70s, local government's been decimated. Um, atomization means you can divide and rule. I think that's true. And I think that's another way that neoliberalism has driven politics to the right. But I'm not, well, I, and I suppose we don't get the forums or you know, without local political forums, we don't have the space to discuss our politics. So yeah, I agree with that. Um, how do we challenge consumerism? Lots of great answers here. Um, I suppose, that, so the things that I was, I was thinking about are, firstly, once politics is something that we consume through the media rather than something that we all talk about together, then those who own the media get a lot of say over the shape of our political conversation and over what counts as politics and what doesn't count as politics. So we've spent a very long time being taught that um, basically the things that neoliberalism believes politics ought to decide, which is essentially security, hence terrorism, um, and, and a couple of other things are kind of counters in politics and almost everything else doesn't. Um, and uh, I think that also when you don't make decisions through the democratic institutions of the state, then as I kind of touched on before, we end up falling back very heavily on the hierarchies that already exist in society. So gender and race and class, and those are very much colored by different nationalisms. So I think it's not surprising that in a world where we no longer believe in the democratic process in politics, as we're told to call it, we end up with very posh leaders because Anglo-British nationalism teaches us that posh people ought to be in charge. The dominant ideology in the UK and certainly in England is that of Anglo-British nationalism, which is built on a kind of uh, adoration of empire and this kind of fictional remembered period when posh people used to run, run everything and we could all be comfortable and rich because we could kill black people and steal their stuff. And that nationalism has built up and built up this kind of cultural identity, which means that people tend to fall back on 
rallying around the flag, which means rallying around the posh people who ought to be in charge according to that nationalist ideology, which is different from the kind of democratic power structure, which is what I think we should believe in. Does that all make sense to people? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on to the stage in a second, but so can I just pause there and ask if anyone has any kind of clarifications or questions or things they'd like just to touch on a bit more, because I'm aware I ran through quite a lot of that quite fast. Hasn't Anglo-British nationalism been instrumentalized by new global finance? That's a very good question. We're gonna to touch on that under the category of state in a moment, but you're right, it could also have been uh, touched on here. Georgina asks, can I talk about more about what I mean by posh? Um, and Sam says, can I summarize quickly? Sure, so, so on the question of what I mean by posh, um, in Britain, we have a cultural class system as well as an economic class system. Um, so in America and in lots of European countries, it's less the case that people who are kind of perceived to be of, ruling class, of the ruling class um, inherit that from their parents through a set of cultural kind of norms and it's more correlates to wealth. Whereas in the UK, um, it's perfectly possible to, you know, I, I have what I would call a posh accent. I come from quite a posh family, but that doesn't necessarily tell you a huge amount about my economic status as a relationship between those things, but it's tangentially uh, tangential. So Boris Johnson presents as very posh. He went to a posh school. He came through the institutions of the British ruling class, but that doesn't mean his family are multi-billionaires. They're not, they're, they're rich, but they're not kind of, you know, oligarchs. Whereas in America, the sort of cultural acceptances of a kind of rich boy bully, and I think Donald Trump epitomizes that much more, and that's why Donald Trump does well in the States, whereas, um, whereas Trump does well in the, sorry, Johnson does well here. Um, someone's asking, um, the partial and now embrace celebrity status and exploit performance qualities to conceal their material base. Yeah, so I'm not gonna get too much into the kind of theory of celebrity culture, but you're absolutely right, Peter, that we need to also understand the role of celebrity and also the interaction between the royal family and the kind of um, global celebrity nexus and the global media industry. And those are, I think, very closely interrelated. And when we think about the British state, in a moment, we have to remember that the royal family sits at the center of the British state and that it, it also sits at the center of kind of performance celebrity and the re reality TV culture. And that that's what keeps the two things going, that keeps what keeps the show on the road, I think is absolutely vital that, you know, at the heart of British constitutional theory is the idea that you basically secure popular consent through the ceremony, through the ceremony of monarchy. And the ceremony of monarchy is delivered to us today through particularly the tabloid media, but also increasingly rolling TV. And I think we can understand the Harry and Meghan split um, as being a kind of split towards social media and away from the kind of tabloid TV culture that the Queen built up. Um, so there's a kind of shift in, um, you know, so, so the Queen introduced TV nationalism really, uh, um, having her uh, in, in, you know, being when, when she was there. Uh, so I was gonna say in throne, because that's the Scots word, but you have correlations in England, don't you? Um, but um, when she was crowned, she, she televised it and kind of brought, it, brought this world of the power of the TV in. So the, anyway, I could bang on about this forever, but I'm going to move on. You've got lots and lots of very interesting questions, which we can maybe get to at the end. But, um, but uh, hopefully that John, John saying Farage wasn't posh. This is true, but well, Farage is posh, but he presented differently. And we can, we can get to that as well. Um, it's also the case that Farage isn't in charge of the country and never managed to actually take power. Um, himself. So I think the second thing you think about though, in the context of the UK in particular, is the British state. Um, and when I say the British state, I mean the kind of broad instruments of government. And that includes obviously the Houses of Parliament, it includes the civil service, it includes the kind of various ways they operate, so the voting systems, it includes all the territories of the British state. So Peter, so we often talked about the, the empire state, which Peter's written in the box there. Um, now again, um, uh, uh, oh, it's kind of flashed out and it's making weird, like someone shared their screen maybe. What's going on here? And then it's- Sorry, frozen. all finished, yeah. 
if people could not sc share their screen, that would be fab. <laughs> it's sometimes easy on a phone. Fine, <laughs> but you're all good now. Sure. Just, as long as we've not been frozen out, that's fine. So again, a question for you. Um, in which hemisphere is most of the land which belongs to the British state? Anyone? Anyone? No? Any guesses? The Northern Hemisphere? No, that would be obvious, wouldn't it? Southern, that is correct. <laughs> yeah, so, so most of the land belongs to the British states in the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, um, on its own, the British Antarctic Territory is seven times the size of, uh, the, um, of the UK landmass. Uh, but there's also, you know, significant other in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, most of the financial wealth for which the British states are responsible for is uh, outside these islands. Um, can anyone name any uh, British territories which include a lot of that natural wealth? No? Yes, no? Caymans, the Virgins, someone else said Caymans, BVI, uh, etc, etc. So, um, absolutely. So, Isle of Man, so, so there's two groups. There's the um, British Overseas Territories, there's places like the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, etc. Um, and yeah, uh, well, Bermuda, not, not Bahamas, but Bermuda. Um, and then, um, and Peter says not to mention Northern Ireland, absolutely Northern Ireland we could talk about in a bit is increasingly becoming the kind of new offshore space. And then there's um, what's called the Crown Dependencies, which is the Isle of Man, um, Jersey and Guernsey. Um, and together they form the most significant money laundry in the world, arguably, although you could argue America's overtaking. There's a kind of debate among specialists in this space. Um, because of them, Roberto Saviano, the uh, leading mafia expert, described the UK as the most corrupt country on earth. Um, because whether you're a Mexican drug lord or a Russian oligarch or a Saudi prince, you take your dodgy finance and you take it to London and you launder it through Britain's overseas territories from London. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so territory is important. But we can also talk about, as Matthew already did, the centralization of the British state. It's the most centralized Western state. You can talk about the facts that the House of Lords is, along with the Iranian Parliament, one of the only two parliaments in the world, in which clerics get automatic seats. I could bang on for hours about the civil service. The civil service was um, founded off the back of a thing called the Northcote Trevelyan Report. Sir Charles Trevelyan, who uh, co-authored that report, is the same Sir Charles Trevelyan, who decided that it would be inappropriate to send food to Ireland during the famine because it was a useful solution to their population problem and essentially committed genocide in Ireland. And, uh, and the reason the civil service was founded as such was that they were um, massively expanding the franchise to more working class men and wanted to make sure that the same people stayed in charge and that the giving the vote to ordinary people wouldn't, um, wouldn't or at least ordinary men, wouldn't uh, change politics in this country too much. And the civil service has um, since then hugely been privatised. So I have a fun game I play occasionally of thinking of any random corner of the state and then seeing if one of the big four accountancy firms is involved in running it and I've yet to find one that isn't. Um, and so on. So, so we have this kind of particular um, state which is, is particularly privatized. So um, a majority of privatizations, majority of the value of privatizations in the world, between 19, sorry, in the OECD, between 1979 and 1997 was in the UK. I think it's 64%. Um, we are the world center for mercenary companies. So Britain's military is now so privatized that we have more mercenary companies than any other country on earth. And so it's not surprising that when this state, which is kind of propped up by, as I said before, this sort of kind of particular kind of toxic empire nationalism, meets a very real world crisis like coronavirus, that it's quite bad at managing it because if you think about the way that the rarefication of politics is managed through the state, and this is my third reason, which I, I didn't come to earlier. One of the most important things that, that they do is make politics about things that people have no experience of. So, for example, most of the people who have most concern about immigration live in places that have very little experience of immigration. Um, when I speak to voters in Eastern Europe, about why it is they're voting for neo-Nazi or far-right parties, one of the main things they talk about is how much they hate trans rights. Now, these are people who've never known you met a trans person. Um, you see 
you know, the same in discussions of sovereignty around Brexit. These are kind of abstract ideas that the media control the conversation about. And all the things that, to go back to our earlier conversation, are, are pushed to the side, are all the conversations about real material things that actually affect our lives. I mean, not that, not that those issues, you know, trans rights don't affect the people who they do affect, i.e. trans people, but they don't affect the neo-Nazi cis people who I met in rural Slovakia. Um, they are, you know, imagined monsters and constructions of essentially the oligarch and media. And so by driving the conversation about what is politics into that space, they get away with not having conversations about the things which actually are politics, about how we live together, about how the NHS is uh, having its um, management system destroyed by the market and its funding isn't nearly sufficient to deal with a potential coming pandemic, how uh, the most important workers are increasingly seeing their wages slashed and how our supermarket supply chain is becoming more and more precarious and so unlikely to survive in a crisis. And so I think it's not surprising that Britain, which is an extreme example of this kind of um, empire state and neoliberalized state, if we understand neoliberalism as kind of the next stage of empire coming home. It's not surprising that Britain is the country in Europe which has got the most deaths and that America, the other most extreme example of this form of politics, is the country in the world now with the most deaths. Because this kind of politics, this kind of state, produces a space in which you can't really have a conversation through the democratic sphere about how you deal with these sorts of problems in a way which hears the voices of experts, hears the voices of the most marginalised who are likely to lead the most support in a time of crisis, hears the voices of everyone and the majority who care about those things, is much more likely to hear the voices of a narrow elite who are going to have the experiences and interests of that narrow elite, of, of the ruling class. And even if they are well-intentioned, which some of them are, they won't have any clue how to solve the problems because they don't know what they are because they've got no way of conversing democratically and as equals with the majority of their citizens. And so that's where I think we're at. And um, I'm going to wrap up there for now, but I'd love to have another, have, continue chatting with you guys. And thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, that was wonderful. Um, the idea now um, is to pass over to people for questions. I've had one or two questions through and I've passed one of them through to Adam as well in the chat. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, just say and then we'll unmute you and unleash you on the rest of us. So yeah, um, do, uh, yeah. do raise your questions. Uh, Adam, if you want to take it from here, um, sure. Just I, I can't because like, they've got lots of comments. I can't see your questions, Matthew. Um, so can you just tell me what they were, and we can start with that. If I can find it. In the meantime, I've had one from Chris, who is asking, um, who is asking, what role do you think independent and leftist media has to play in shifting power um, in the British state and in the economy? Sure. So um, one of the things that's been really interesting for me over the last few years is, um, is kind of experiencing the growth of what you might call independent media. So I started working for Open Democracy in 2013. Um, and at the time, a lot of my job was just fundraising. And it kept felt like quite often I could easily have lost my job, could have run out of money. And every time we were raising money, we had to convince people that they should fund the media at all before we could get into a conversation about why they should fund us and the project that we're proposing to them. And what's been astonishing is over the last five years, we don't have to have the first two parts of that conversation. People absolutely understand that, whether it's kind of big progressive donors or individuals, you know, ordinary individuals, they understand that the media is entirely broken and that we need a new media. And so it's been fascinating to kind of be able to grow as an organization off the back of that realization. Um, and I think it's absolutely vital. I think that, you know, it's been amazing to see how, you know, to go back further, when I was a student activist in the early noughties, we'd talk about how it would be important to have alternative media. And the alternative media that existed was essentially indie media, for those of you old enough to remember it, which is probably not many of you. And while occasionally it did some good work, it was mostly pretty bad. And in the kind of 15 years that have followed, we have, you know, managed across the world to build up a whole load of 
new institutions which aren't owned by oligarchs for profit and expand the audiences of those significantly to the point that, you know, absolutely, it creates a whole space for a different conversation about the world and for that more democratic conversation, hopefully, that I kind of talked about at the beginning that isn't just controlled and led by oligarchs and their interests. So, um, so I think it's really important. And I think that one of the other things that shifted is that, to use another bit of kind of um, political theory, the kind of previous generations um, of the left tended to go on what used to be called the long march through the institutions, where you would go and work for, you know, some of the big political institutions, whether that's the newspapers or the media or, or a university or whatever. And, uh, and what's been, um, what I think is interesting is watching as a new set of institutions of the left have kind of grown up, and whether that's media or other kinds of organisation, have grown up over the last decade or so. And I suspect in this crisis, um, that will kind of stress test a lot of institutions, a lot of the older and already dying institutions will probably be killed off by the current crisis, while others will flourish and thrive. Great, thanks very much. And um, we've got one from Georgina. Um, Georgina wanted to ask about the role of the market um, in all of this, um, and ask more specifically, um, whether privatization leads to the negation of values like democracy and, and critical discussion. Just if you'd say a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So, so um, if you think that you know, democracy is the idea of one person, one vote, or one person, one say, um, neoliberalism and the way it privatizes decisions to the market, but also deregulation, you know, the way that it, it says the state shouldn't regulate the market and shouldn't regulate, you know, shouldn't have a say in, you know, the kind of boundaries of the market. Um, and also austerity cuts, because that means less social spending and more private spending as a proportion. Um, all shift from that idea of one person, one vote, to one pound or dollar or yen or whatever it is, one vote. And I think there's a kind of not just a practical immediate implication of that, which is that rich people get more of a say, but also that that process and the process of atomization, which comes with it, breaks down our communities and it's you know, the inequality it produces stretches society apart and makes it much, much harder for us to have a conversation together as a society with the result that we're really bad at democracy. And because we're really bad at democracy, it's not surprising people then don't trust democracy to make the decisions that we have to make as a society. It's not surprising once people's experience of democracy is in, is in a world which is so warped by inequality that they think it doesn't work. And I think you see this if you just wander around the country. Um, one of the things I found fascinating a couple of years ago was I, I, for a project I was involved in, I spent a lot of time just wandering around kind of in the suburbs and, uh, um, you know, towns in the Midlands and things, and was totally amazed at the number of gated communities and kind of big fences that were everywhere. I'm quite used to wandering around Northern Ireland, which is a country divided by walls. You know, the way they secured peace in Northern Ireland is building massive militarized walls between the Protestant and Catholic communities. But realizing that actually England isn't that far away from that now, just building walls dividing rich and poor for the purpose of security. And that's, you know, that's happened over the last 15 years. The rise of gated communities is very recent. And how can you have a democracy in a society where you don't have any kind of functional community? Great, thanks very much. And um, we've got loads of these streaming in. Um, we've got two in particular about like what democracy means and, and what that looks like. Um, also, I'll, I'll take both of those at, at once, I guess. Um, uh, Jamie asked um, whether democracy has to be, in quotes, one person, one vote, and whether there can be more consensus-based and more participatory models of politics. Um, and someone else followed up, uh, uh, I think, yeah, Lolo Cars Jones followed up asking whether and, and how we can reinvigorate democratic en engagement at a sort of hyper-local level. I wonder if you could address that. Sure. Um... So it's the first question. Uh, absolutely. When I say one person, one vote, I don't mean vote in the sense of you go to a ballot box and put a cross in a box. I mean that, um, you know, we all, well, 
And I don't even think it necessarily should be one person one, but I think that ultimately democracy should mean that we all get a say that is commensurate with the size of the impact of decision upon us. Um, and obviously that, you know, that's why I don't get a vote in Burmese elections quite rightly. Um, and, and if you extend that principle, then that encompasses a huge amount. Um, and absolutely, I think, you know, that we, and particularly as Greens, we'd be thinking hard about how to entirely replace our very broken political institutions. And that what I'm in favour of is a mixed model of direction representative democracy and also a mix of different kinds of direction representative democracy within that. Um, so, for example, I would argue that we should abolish the House of Lords and replace it with a jury system where each bill that goes through Westminster is then, you know, overseen by a, a jury of randomly selected citizens. Um, I think that the whole new constitution should be written by um, essentially a jury or a series of juries similarly. Um, I think that very local decisions should be made, you know, in a direct participatory way. So in Latin America in particular, although in the last few years across Europe as well, actually including here in Edinburgh, where I live, um, there have been very successful experiments with participatory budgeting, where you say to the community, you know, our, our city or our area has this much money to spend, let's all get together and chat about how to spend this. And you know, even the World Bank has found that, you know, that is a much better way of managing a city budget than having an elected council do, um, because the collective wisdom that people have is much more effective. And, and when there's millions of pounds on the line, or billions of pounds. So the time which the city which did this in um, in Brazil, you know, we're talking about multi-billion dollar budgets, and you know, so so people show up. You know, it's not like you know people do care about their community. This kind of idea of apathy is nonsense. You know, when you give people actual power to make actual decisions, all the evidence is, of course, they take part in them. The reason they don't vote is they don't believe that those institutions are going to reflect their views, and they're probably right. Um, and so the second question was, um, it's more about agency in a way. So how do you get people to participate more? And so I'm going to answer this, assuming what you mean is like, what can you do now? Not what could one do if one was redesigning the state? Um, and I, I don't think that, you know, I, I think right now, join mutual aid groups, um, support your neighbours, um, take part in those events that are happening, like, you know, Thursday night applauses and then politicize them. So find ways to make those about the things they should be about and challenging the powerful rather than a kind of, you know, the kind of kind of nationalistic celebration that the Queen tried to make them into in her speech. Um, and I think that at the moment, the main political contest is over the meaning of rainbows in windows and applause on a Thursday night and, um, you know, delivered through the structures of mutual aid groups and that um, that's where you need to start and that that's convenient in a sense because that's where you are and it's very hard to, part to put participate in politics other than through this kind of conversation other than at the most local level and people already are participating in politics at the local level. Every child you put a rainbow in their window is making a political statement but they might want some help thinking through what that statement means and who it's directed at. Great, we've got loads more streaming in. A uh, particularly interesting one from Pip, who's asking what effect the internet has had on this whole constellation of forces and how much that has either centralised power or redistributed it by giving more people like more ability to speak. So if you could come in on that, that'd be wonderful. Sure, I mean, I feel like probably everyone on this call has a view on that and I, I'm not sure I'm any, you know, I have anything more to say than than that, I, I suppose I, I would say a few things. The first is, you know, we've seen a huge shift over the last decade in that question. So, you know, the decade began with um, the uprising across the Arab world and this sort of sense that, you know, Twitter allowed this kind of mobilization. Um, and then it ended with this sort of sense that we're moving towards kind of perhaps almost sort of Chinese or Hungarian style authoritarian capitalism or surveillance capitalism delivered through, um, you know, this, these same institutions. And I think that the answer is in a sense that it's very contested and this is a contested space and it's space, it's a fight that we have to win. Um, so it, it does, you know, it does both those things. It both centralizes power in what, as I said before, are now the biggest companies in the world. You know, the, the fact that in the last 
five or so years, we've seen a shift from oil companies being the biggest in the world to the big data giants being the biggest companies in the world is probably one of the biggest shifts we're going to see in our lifetime, along with climate change, ecological crisis, the rise of China, um, maybe more pandemics. We have to add to the list now. Um, the shift in gender roles, etc. But you know, it's going to be a, a huge, huge historic shift. And yes, those companies are terrifying. And the way that they directly link up, as they do now, with um, the main states in the world's two superpowers is going to be the big threat to our democracy. You know, the, if you look at um, people like Peter Thiel, who's the founder of a company called Palantir, but also on the board of Facebook, um, who got funding to found Palantir from the Department of Defense in America, and he named it after the all-seeing stone in the Lord of the Rings, having written an essay about how, because women got the vote, um, because it was pretty, uh, you know, feminism has destroyed democracy, so we need to replace democracy um, with something which will defend capitalism from democracy, and then find this company is running for public defense. You know, we, we should be very concerned. And so, you know, that's a kind of rambling answer to your question, but it's kind of both those things. It's a contested space and we need to fight over it. And the question is who owns it? You know, at the moment, these are, you know, the main companies who facilitate these things are largely, owned by a tiny number of shareholders in the most powerful country in the world. And that's very dangerous. Great. Um, uh, Johan uh, is sort of bringing his question back to the, the, the question of Anglo-British nationalism. And he's asking whether there's a role for progressive nationalism, um, that he identifies with the SNP and Plaid Cymru, in undermining the sort of Anglo-British variant that that is currently sort of dominant in the UK. Um, so yeah, should you know, should the left be looking to support and promote the SNP implied as antidotes to it, or arguing against these nationalisms across the board? Yeah, it's a complicated question, isn't it? I mean, so I, I not that you guess from my accent, but I'm Scottish. I voted in favour of independence in 2014. I will do again whenever I get the chance. The Scottish Greens are in favour of independence. Um, I think that in practice, the um, you know the, England will continue to vote Tory as long as the illusions of Anglo-British nationalism maintain. You know, vote Tory most of the time, or sometimes, you know, as you've seen over the last hundred and fifty years, sometimes the Tories will lose, but mostly they win, and that's how Anglo-British nationalism plays out. They are the party of Anglo-British nationalism, and you know, and so mostly they win. And until um, the kind of illusions of empire uh, begin to crumble, that will continue to be the case. And I agree that the, the most likely way that's going to happen is through Scotland leaving the UK and to some extent through Northern Ireland leaving the UK, although I suspect that will have less kind of psychological impact on that particular breed of nationalism. And therefore there is a strategic alliance to be made with um, both Scottish and Welsh nationalisms. But at the same time, I think it's very important to challenge those nationalisms and understand that they are nationalisms and although that doesn't mean that they're racist you know the nationalism is the underlying ideology of almost all modern politics the Labour Party is a nationalist party even Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party was a nationalist party because they were arguing to act politically through the nation state and their rhetoric consistently served to reinforce the idea of that state they just wanted to twist what that meant into more positive things. Likewise, the SNP are a nationalist party. They believe that Scotland should be independent because Scotland is a country and countries ought to be independent. That's a nationalist belief, but it's not necessarily a racist belief. They believe that people of all races and cultures should be able to participate in the thing in the imagined community that is Scotland. But that's also a, you know, ultimately a dangerous, or at least a, an idea we should challenge because there isn't just one imagined community in Scotland. There are many. Um, and uh, we should, you know, remember that even though it's possible to be a nationalist and an internationalist, internationalism, um, after all, relies on the idea of nationalism, we do need to push beyond the idea of, you know, the nation as the core unit of organising democratically in general and have decisions made. If you think about what I said about democracy earlier, that democracy is a system, well, the most pure form of democracy is a system in which people get a say in decisions insofar as they affect them, then 
you can't draw lines around particular bits of maps and say, you know, these are the places, you know, this, we're going to make all these decisions in this place and that's sovereign. You know, sovereignty should lie with the people and then you should pool it at different levels depending on what the decision is. And some of those will be geographical and different geographical units and others will not be. So yes to Scottish and Welsh independence, absolutely. Yes to dismembering the British state, absolutely. That does mean strategic alliances with some kinds of potentially more progressive nationalisms, but also your role in those movements has to be to challenge and question those nationalisms as you go. And uh, for those of us on the Scottish left who've been very familiar with that process, you know, we can assure you it's frustrating. Great, thanks very much. Um, we've probably got time for maybe one or two more questions um, before we finish up and I pass back to Rosie. Um, so the, the next one um, from Kate Benson um, is about how to communicate to people that politics is something that, that's important and relevant to them. So how do we fight that process of reification um, and take politics back from out there and bring it into their lives? Um, should we take that and the other ones together and then, and then I can do them together if that's all right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the last one was about sort of the, the traditional what should the Greens do question. So um, Alexander Salins wanted to know whether um, there were three things that you think the Green parties within the UK should be um, focusing on and promoting um, to sort of strengthen and, and reinvigorate democracy. Um, sure. Good, good questions. Um, what should the Greens do? Um, so I'm writing them down, trying to forget. The thing about reification, and this comes back to one of the questions as well, is it comes primarily from people's experience of life and of life in a neoliberal world, rather than from any argument anyone's ever made. You know, neoliberals don't ever really make the case for what they believe because no one really believes it when you say it to them. You know, the, even if you look at the polling, people tend to disagree with all the core tenets of neoliberalism in massive majorities. They take control of powerful institutions because their ideas benefit the, the interest of the powerful, and then they steer conversation away from the core things they're doing so that you never get to talk about it. They don't, they don't sway people. So the way to undo that work is, I'm afraid, through the hard work of organizing at a community level and involving people in politics and you know being as participatory as, participatory as possible in your political processes because it's only through the experience of activism politics and organizing working for them that people begin to be convinced that they can work um so that's hard it's not you know you can have a conversation with people as much as you like and of course you can sometimes persuade people but primarily it's through people's experiences that they'll change their minds and um and that's what matters most um what two three, three things should greens do i think the first thing i'd say is something i've been saying since 2015 so since corbyn um took over the labor party and which has frustrated me somewhat i mean people some people have tried doing this and i don't mean to be critical but you know the, the green party um, originally of the UK and now England and Wales and Scotland separately and, and Northern Ireland and Ireland separately um, was founded with four core tenets of which one was radical democracy is radical democracy you know, one of the four pillars of democracy and for me it's the most important one because it's the one that's about how you do all the other things you know you don't secure ecological justice or social justice or peace without um, an understanding of radical democracy. And it's what makes Greens different from other left parties, I think. And it's also the most popular one. You know, we think about the most um, significant political events of the last decade in the UK. They are the Brexit referendum and the Scottish independence referendum, as measured by turnout, as measured by participation, by almost any measure you can imagine. And they are both questions about the location of political power. And yet, as Greens, we've never managed to articulate ourselves as all, you know, parties, other than maybe the Scottish Greens during the independence referendum for a moment in 2014, but not even really since then, have never managed to articulate themselves as the parties that are primarily in favour of a radical redistribution of power 
from British states to our communities. And I think that, you know, we might have seen a very different political history over the last five years if we'd done that. Um, I also think that that requires, you know, as, as well as policy and, and you know, argument and what you say when you have slots in the media and so on, there's also an electoral question there. So I've argued electorally for a long time that um, Greens should probably have been adopting in anywhere but Westminster strategy, where not that you don't ultimately aim to guess MPs, but that, and you know, obviously we should, you know, the Greens should be defending Brighton Pavilion and, and, and so on, but that much more resource should be put into winning mayoral elections and police and crime commissioner elections and elections away from Westminster because people quite rightly understand that the Westminster system is totally broken and, and the, you know, the, the way to build power in modern politics, as we've seen with Boris Johnson becoming prime minister, is I, now, I think, I suspect now through institutions other than Westminster itself and, and through the other institutions which have been kind of forced out through compromises over the last uh, decade or, well, two now, um, almost three. And so, um, and so I suppose those would be the two things I would start with. And probably that requires internally um, redistribution of funding and of budgets to those local parties who have serious strategies to uh, act in those ways. Um, and, you know, pouring of funds and activists behind some of those election campaigns and choosing strategically and so on. And Steve, Steve Jackson says Target Twin is doing that. Yes, but I suppose I'm saying more than a council level. So things like mayoral elections, um, police and crime commissioner elections. Uh, I, I felt very strongly that the Green Party of England and Wales should have put a lot of money into the Northern Irish Assembly elections, which took place last year, um, or no, sorry, two years ago now. And, um, you know, it, it was interesting to me that Belfast South was the seat, the Westminster seat, in which Greens were closest to winning in 2015, sorry, in 2017, um, after Brighton Pavilion, obviously, in terms of the percentage of the vote. And by 2019, the Green candidate had withdrawn because there was no serious chance of doing well. So they supported the SDLP, who went on to win it from the DUP anyway. I think that if as Greens across these islands, we'd play our cards differently, then Claire Bailey would be an MP right now. Great, thanks very much. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but that was wonderful and illuminating for me at least. So one person is definitely leaving this call oh, much you. happier. Um, before we close up, I'm going to pass over to Rosie, who has a few very important things to ask you, some of which you can do in the next two minutes um, to one make thing. our series of political education even more impactful um, than it already is. So yeah, over to Rosie. Go for Adam if you wanted to jump in as a last final. Sure. Yeah. I, I forgot the third thing I meant to say, which was give money to the Young Greens. <laughs> Oh, reading my mind. We didn't even plan that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. <laughs> thanks so much, Adam. Um, I'm blown away. My notes on that talk are a mess, but I've, I've taken in so much as well. I'm sure other people have as well. So thank you so much, Adam. It's just such a delight to have you at our events um, online, offline, and wherever and wherever we can get you. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, as uh, we said before on this, this is one of many um, events that we've got coming up. Um, and this Thursday in particular, we've got Sean Berry, who is co-leader of the Green Party. If you did not know, you will get to ask her questions and find out more about um her current campaign and also she'll be speaking specifically on um an issue that um like feels particularly um poignant at the moment which is the housing crisis um and how we um achieve housing justice for all um a space in which has been felt like particularly hard during the current crisis as well so she'll be speaking on thursday we've got Assad Rahman who is director of war on want coming up next week speaking on climate change capitalism and colonialism um all three intrinsically interlinked so how do we tackle them all at once um and we've also got um our very own Maxon Brown who is 17 18 or I don't know young youthful and spirited a climate striker who is speaking about where do we go next for the climate strikes so all these discussions all these talks um, we're really excited about we would love for you to come to them I'm going to stick a link in the box um, in the chat right now so that you can come along to our next talk with Sean we've also got a load up on the website um, so we'll 
hold on i'll only send that to matthew otherwise so yes please do come along to this um, um on thursday at 8 p.m this week that's sean berry um the other thing is we've got loads of people on this call who may be um just friends of the green party may not be members um if you would like to um get involved please do join the party um join what we're doing it's an amazing um community to be a part of um and you can really get get stuck in um and help um, as to what we're doing it's only three pound a month um, as a standard fee or if you're a student six pound a year so not too bad um, and the final thing is as Adam was saying I think one of the last points that you were making just then was about building power in other institutions and the power that we've seen mutual aid groups currently um, like um, delivering in our communities I think highlights one thing that we've known for a long time that like change is not going to happen through the courts through Westminster it's not going to happen because of the landlords it's not going to be happening it's not going to happen um, through the bosses it's going to happen in the spaces in which we can create change and that's in our schools that's in our communities that's on our campuses um, and that's in like local spaces and um, um, including um, infrastructure like local government so some of the things that we're really proud to be doing right now in the young greens is delivering um, powerful campaigns to try and get the right voices in those spaces um, and completely um, take back the power. So if you'd like to see more of that, we want to be running these training events, these, uh, this political education, all of that is about building power while we can in our living rooms and our strange odd studies for the time being, um, half bedroom, half studies, um, we're in these places. Um, if you can help us um, build that power, we would so, so appreciate it if you could um, make it happen by backing um, the work with two pound a month all of that will help us do like three incredible things it will help us promote these um, events it will help us build this webinar subscription up um, uh, it's very expensive <laughs> and also um, as i said earlier we've got a massive national event coming up soon too so please do click the link and follow it um, the final th many 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 things the final link i'm going to put in is we would love it if you could just share what we've been doing recently uh, on it sorry if you could share um this click to tweet this is where i put words in your mouth um basically if you follow this tiny link it will bring you up a um, pre-filled tweet that basically says adam was amazing this heart like night was the night of my week i want to go to more of them the young greens are running another one on thursday get down to it sort of in so you know so many characters and um, it'd be wonderful if you click click that link um and tweet it out to let other people know um there's a number of things there we'll leave the chat open for a little while but um but just once again to thank you all and thank you matthew for hosting and thank you so much adam for joining us this week it's been a pleasure to have you all and see all your faces and thank you so much for your contributions and questions as well um until next week no until this week until thursday two days time um Thank you all and speak to you soon. Cheers. Bye everyone. Thanks, bye. Thanks everyone.